The Power of the Patient Project, the National Library of Patient Rights and Advocacy, presents The Monthly Magazine, a monthly recap of our newest interviews with prominent healthcare providers and patients from across the country, hosted by our celebrated broadcast team. I'm Dub Sinclair, and welcome to our monthly magazine. The Monthly Magazine is a collection of some of our favorite interviews from this month featuring interesting people who talk about wellness and medicine as it affects you, the patient. In our first interview, Millie Long speaks with Dr. Brendan Spiegel about how virtual reality is being used in medicine. This fascinating interview gives us insight into what the future may look like for healthcare. Imagine going to the doctor for insomnia and instead of being prescribed Ambien, the doctor tells you to go to the beach. Or if you complain about pain, you're sent to fly among the clouds. Or Alzheimer's patients are transported to the hospital to play games all day. Technology has advanced at an extremely rapid pace over the years, and we're seeing a prolific amount of technology being used in medicine. I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Brennan Spiegel, renowned author, professor, and director of health services research at Cedar sinai He explained how he and his team are using digital health technologies to help his patients with everything from irritable bowel syndrome to depression. He tells us that virtual reality is more than just fun and games. So we have a VR treatment we're creating where you really uh, sit in this movie theater and the movie theater is your mind and you're looking up on the screen and that what's happening on the screen are the thoughts in your mind. And uh, you have to challenge those thoughts and tell the projectionist behind you to change the movie if things don't look the way you want them to. And we actually use 360 degree VR where you fly right into your thoughts and you, and you swirl around inside of them. And so this is just an example of what we can do. Or we have done this with women undergoing, you know, going through labor and delivery. Um, Also, uh, I've never been through that, but, um, (laughs) you know, I understand it's, it can be uncomfortable, uh, painful. Um, (laughs) I've seen it many times, uh, but we use virtual reality there as well, where um, women who are in labor can wear the headset. And as they breathe in and out, the microphone on the headset detects their breathing and they can breathe life into a tree or a forest. Uh, The forest can expand and contract with their breathing in this Lamaze style biofeedback. So that's yet another example. And I can go on and on, I'll stop there, but we have so many other examples where we use VR for pain and, and many other conditions. As a woman who has given birth six times, four of them with no anesthesia, to hear that these technologies like virtual reality can be used for women in labor and delivery was extremely exciting to me. To think that it could change an entire industry because having an alternative to traditional medicine means less epidurals are used and less epidurals means fewer C-sections. So it just brought me joy to know that women now have another option that can reduce their risk for surgery and give them the natural birth that they've always wanted. Dr. Spiegel told me that it's those life-changing stories that inspired him to write his book, VRX, How Virtual Therapeutics Will Revolutionize Medicine. What inspired you to write that book in the first place? Well, really, it was the stories from the patients themselves that inspired me to put it all down into words. And, you know, after having used VR in 3,000 or more patients, there's been so many incredible stories. And I wanted to capture some of those stories uh, in the book. And, you know, one that I talk about in the book and that really comes to mind is um, one particular patient who had really significant abdominal pain and had been hospitalized for her pain. And, you know, I happen to be a gastroenterologist, so they called me in to help figure out what was going on with the pain. And, you know, she had been looked at carefully, had had CT scans and endoscopies where he put a camera in the stomach and lab tests and everything had been normal. So we didn't know what was going on. So I decided to use a virtual reality headset. And I put this headset um, on her head and she went from being in a hospital room to being transformed into swimming with dolphins. All of a sudden she's underwater and she's swimming with dolphins. She told me she really liked animals. So we thought that would make sense just to kind of distract her from you know, the distress of being in a hospital and suffering from pain. And so she's looking around and she can hear the, uh, the squeaking dolphins and she's looking around in the water, listening to music. When after about four minutes, she started to cry. And I said, you know, are you okay? She said, you know, yeah, um, 
I'm okay, but I think I know why I have this pain. And I said, really, you know, tell me more. She said, I think it's because of my brother. And I was surprised. I said, your brother, uh, she said, you know, yeah, my brother, you know, he died of stomach cancer. And I think that's how I'm going to die too. And I said, but we've been inside your stomach. We put a camera in there and there is no cancer. And she said, I know, I know you guys keep telling me that, but I haven't been willing to accept it. But there's something about these dolphins that they're telling me I need to move on with my life. I need to accept this and move on. And she said, you know, a year on the couch and I wouldn't have figured this out, but there's something about these dolphins. And she said, by the way, my stomach pain is better too. And I'm ready to go home. What an incredible story. It would have taken her hours of dedicated, focused meditation to reach that level of Zen on her own. Dr. Spiegel explained that the future of these technologies is a fast track to complete relaxation and even greater control over the brain to aid in health and wellness. In our next interview, Casey Ayubera talks with Elizabeth Linden about cluster headaches, a chronic and very painful condition, both physically and emotionally. As we learned, this rare condition is greatly misunderstood, even by doctors. Headaches. Everyone experiences them, right? As uncomfortable as they may be, at least everyone knows the feeling. Or at least that's what I thought before I interviewed Elizabeth Linden, a lifelong sufferer of cluster headaches. Cluster headaches are also known as suicide headaches. I'd heard the term cluster headaches before, but up till now, I just thought, or up till then, I should say, I just thought it meant a cluster of headaches happening in a short period of time. Not fun, but not too bad. When I learned what cluster headaches really are, I was shocked. Cluster headaches, also known as, they're also known as suicide headaches and it's a uh, disorder affecting, it's called a trigeminal nerve. Um, and uh, they're typically uh, pain, pain that affects one side of the head around your eye. For me, it's always around my left eye. For some people, it's on, on the right. And it, it, for, uh, it feels like a hot poker above the eye it, or Ouch. In the eye. and it also feels like an ax on your head Ooh. at the same time. And <laughs> during an attack, you may, feel, um, you may see uh, the affected eye droop or tear up. Luckily, Elizabeth was able to find moments and methods of comfort. She talked a little later about the communities built by patients who share the same rare disease and how important they are. This opened my eyes to how isolating a condition like cluster headaches could be. A condition that, if I didn't know any better, I would have thought was the same as a regular headache. Elizabeth said it best. And I feel like we're misunderstood in respect, like if you say I have a headache, a lot of people associate that with migraine. So, you know, if you say, hey, I have a cluster headache, uh, people will uh, try to be empathetic, but they think it's a migraine where it's just something totally different. Like I, I was a teacher and I'd be like, oh, I have a headache. I need to leave the classroom. And, and someone would be like, oh, can you wait a half an hour? It's like, no, I need to leave right now. I can't handle it. However, there's still work to be done in the medical field. And Elizabeth experienced these pitfalls firsthand. One of my favorite moments in Elizabeth's interview came when she said this. And so it is, you know, it, it, it is possible to get a wrong diagnosis. But uh, as a, when a patient like reports like no improvement, I feel like it's really important to keep asking questions. Um, and if, the, if there's uh, uh, a patient who uh, receives like no uh, relief from a treatment, like I did initially from their nose and throat, uh, you have to keep refer you have to refer them to someplace else you know? mm -hmm. and and maybe I didn't follow up I can't really remember I, I made it may have just gotten really frustrated at that point um, and uh, I think that uh, patients need like a doctor's expert of advice of where to go next if the treatment fails this is crucial for all doctors to remember no matter what condition they treat up next, I have the privilege of speaking with Dr. David Posen about stress management in the workplace. This is an interesting interview that provides employees and employers on ways to manage stress. Stress in the workplace is becoming increasingly common. More and more people seem to be experiencing burnout and low productivity levels because of this. I have the honor of speaking with Dr. David Posen, a renowned author, speaker, and educator who has dedicated a practice specifically for stress management. It seems like more and more companies are trying to save money by cutting back on how many employees they hire. 
But according to Dr. Posen, these budget cuts are actually leading employees to high levels of stress, anxiety, and even depression. And so uh, the first thing is that I looked at where, in my mind, what the whole story was about, what the problem is. And so I talked about where the stress is coming from. So too much work, a high workload, too fast a pace, too high expectations, too much pressure, and not enough resources. And this is something I was hearing over and over again. They kept, and I would hear it from patients in my office, they kept cutting uh, headcount and then expected those lucky survivors to pick up the, the slack and, and pick up all of that work as well. And I even had, I had one patient who, um, he had a team of 10 people. They cut him down to three and then added another project for him. And so too few resources, big problem. Mm -hmm. So um, as a result of that, people were experiencing high stress, working longer hours, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, self-neglect, because when you're working longer hours, you don't have time for adequate sleep, regular exercise, you know, good nutrition and, and, and so on, uh, much less time with friends and family. Um, but also uh, it was leading to poor coping strategies. You know, people were, were uh, you know, smoking and drinking and, and, uh, and eating comfort foods uh, when they were stressed out instead of maybe meditating or going for a, a bike ride or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so the net net of that is that people were getting sick, physically sick, um, but it also was affecting mood and um, and mostly depression. I mean, anxiety and depression. I see both in my practice. As a student who's close to graduating college, I have learned that multitasking skills are highly sought after and great to add to your resume. But as Dr. Posen explains, I learned that these skills should actually start to be disencouraged to increase productivity in the workplace and decrease stress. And another thing, by the way, is to discourage multitasking. It's so, so interesting. Some people are actually asked in their uh, interviews, you know, how good are you at multitasking? Multitasking, first of all, is physiologically impossible to do two things at exactly the same time. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 um, it impairs productivity and performance dramatically. So we need to start talking about these ideas in the workplace. And one of the best places to get suggestions is ask employees. You know, sometimes they're, they're asked to fill out, uh, you know, surveys and so on and they make suggestions. And they're the people who, who know best what would be more efficient because they're the ones who are dealing with the frustrations and the obstacles um, and so on. And they often see solutions. You know, I sometimes in my seminars say, what, what are some suggestions you can make for you know, handling the workload better? And like I'll do maybe a five or seven minute uh, a table exercise and then we gather the information in five or seven minutes. They come up with half, half a dozen really good suggestions. Um, so the best people to ask are the people who know, because they're the people in the front lines dealing with the issues as well. Who would have thought that by decreasing the number of hours spent in a workday would actually increase productivity and make the overall workplace more enjoyable for everyone? Finally, Charlotte Grinnell interviewed Dr. Lori Ryland on prioritizing mental health and some of the conflicts that face mental health care services. Here's a segment of that interview. Prioritizing your mental health has become more crucial than ever during this past year. The deep impacts of the coronavirus are endless, but the one that's highlighted in this discussion is how these, this year has compromised the mental health of countless individuals. I had the honor of sitting down with Dr. Lori Ryland, a prominent psychologist and expert in addictions therapy. In this insightful interview, Dr. Ryland discusses many of the current issues faced by both patients and providers surrounding mental health and healthy coping, coping mechanisms to cope during this time. One of the coping mechanisms that she discusses is the use of mindfulness techniques. So, um, you know, for those who are really struggling right now or who are working with people who are struggling right now, um, you know, there are a couple of things to, to keep in mind. So if you're working with clients or patients, you know, trying to have them work on being um, more mindful and present in today, right? Because as a psychologist, one thing we work on a lot is trying to live through this moment and not get wrapped up in fears or shame about the past or not fears and concerns about the future, because often this moment's okay 
right? The moment that we're, we're living in right now is usually not the problem. Usually it's concern about what might happen or, you know, is my family member going to get sick or, you know, what, what is going to happen with the economy? So, so trying to focus on, on where you are right now and use mindfulness activities to be present can be extremely helpful, not just for those that you treat, but for yourself, you know, if you're struggling as well or you're someone who is struggling. Um, some of the different mindfulness practices can be, you know, like um, um, focusing on practicing meditation. If you haven't done anything like that before, you can easily Google it, go on YouTube, find some examples, start to practice. It can be prayer. It can be, you know, um, focusing on the breath. It can be yoga. You know, what I mean, there's so many different ways that you can focus on being more present. One of the reasons that this interview was so special for me to host was because I've taken the time and put in the work this year to focus on mindfulness. It was something that I always wanted to do, but I told myself that I didn't have the time. Dr. Lori Ryland puts that to rest by discussing an easy way to incorpor incorporate mindfulness into your daily life. One of these practices is through journaling. Um, so journaling can be helpful. Something as simple as um, revisiting things that you used to enjoy or taking up a new hobby, like knitting or putting jigsaw puzzles together or something that can be a, a healthy distraction for the moment that can occupy your mind and give you a break, you know, from some of the stress that, that is so prevalent right now. In addition to providing this valuable advice on how to cope during this time, Dr. Ryland also offered insight into the stigma attached to mental health and what we can do to fight the stigma, starting with educating ourselves on mental health issues. And that's our monthly magazine. We hope that you enjoyed, and I invite you to watch any of these interviews along with hundreds of others by logging on to thepowerofthepatient.org. Be sure to also follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Dawson Claire with The Power of the Patient Project.